Allah me warkar da ni ka zo ka warkar da ni Glory to God. We are here once more in our Pentecost journey. Today is the sixth day of the novena to the Holy Spirit in preparation for this year's Pentecost. We have been in this journey of special encounter with the person of the Holy Spirit. So every teaching, one way or the other, is anchored on the person of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and that is why today we shall be looking at another topic to build on what we shared yesterday. Yesterday was a question who was thirsty? Jesus asked, Is there anyone still thirsty? Come unto me. Today we are looking at a topic that says, By my Spirit says the Lord. By my spirit, says the Lord, in spiritu meu, dicit dominus. In spiritu meu, dicit dominus. By my spirit, says the Lord. Our text is gotten from Zechariah chapter 4, from verse 6 uh, through 9. Let us look at it to know exactly what the scripture is saying. Zechariah chapter 4 from verse 6. <clears throat> then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord come unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Our topic is from the six, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, said in spiritu meo, dicit dominus exercitum, not but not by, but by my spirit, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, as a background to our teaching, we discover that we need to know certain things for us to key into what God said to Zerubbabel. In the first place, the people of Israel were taken into exile. They stayed for a period of 70 years in exile in Babylon. So this passage is immediately they returned from exile. Joshua was the high priest. Zerubbabel was their governor. They returned from exile to meet a city in ruin. Jerusalem dilapidated. Their, their, their temple was just a heap of rubbish. Everything demolished. Everything destroyed. As for finance, their purse was lean. They didn't have much. And therefore, there was discouragement in the atmosphere. Many of them we are discouraged. So Gov uh, Zerubbabel was the governor of a discouraged people. He was a governor, the governor of a discouraged people. That is the background to what we are sharing. It's just like in our forum, let's assume that a prayer group is suspended after one year, after seven months, after three years, and you regroup again and you are made the coordinator. After three years or after two years, you regroup again and you are not made the coordinator. Within those three years, many people's love would have waxed cold. Zeal would have waxed cold. That was the situation that, that Zerubbabel found himself. 
And so, he was now faced with something that is almost near impossible to rebuild the temple. Now, it is easier to build than to rebuild for those who are engineers or in the building industry. According to Greek, the word to build is called oikodomeo or kataskuazo. Oikodomeo or kataskuazo has to do with building up something, like a building, like a house, to furnish something. But when it means to build upon, to rebuild, they call it an oikodomeo. The Greek calls it anoikodemo, from ana, that is a game, to build a game. Just imagine where a house collapsed and you are asked to rebuild it. It's more difficult than just giving a land to start building. So what faced Zerubbabel was a difficult task. I am talking to somebody who is also in a difficult situation. I may not know the challenge you are in right now. Probably you are the Zerubbabel we are talking about. Maybe there are difficulties surrounding your life, surrounding your destiny, surrounding your marriage, surrounding your business, and you are like, how do I go about it? That was the situation Zerubbabel was in before the passage in question. So let us look at the passage in question. After the background, the next thing the Bible said that God answered Zerubbabel. God answered Zerubbabel. Then he answered. That means for God to answer means that Zerubbabel had been talking or praying. He had been talking or praying. So what we are reading was the response he got from his prayer. The response he got for what you know he had taken up, something had gone up, and something is coming down. And the Bible said, God answered Zerubbabel. He had been talking. And so I want to challenge you. No matter the difficulty surrounding your life, stop grumbling. Go into prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Why? If you speak, the Lord will answer you. What is that question in your heart? What is that question on your head? What is that question in your life? What is that thing that is challenging you, causing you sleepless nights? It's not a time for you to begin to murmur. It's not a time for you to begin to complain. Talk to the Lord. Pray to the Lord. For God will always answer. I tell you, there is an answer for your question. James chapter 5 verse 13 says, Is there anyone afflicted? It didn't say cry. It didn't say weep. It didn't say mourn. It didn't say lament. It didn't say shed tears. He didn't say, look for someone to complain to. No. He said, is there anyone afflicted? Pray. What is the answer? Prayer. When you are oppressed, pray. When you are suppressed, pray. When you are persecuted, pray. When you are in pain, pray. When you are weak, pray. When things are not moving as expected, pray. What is prayer? Divine communication. A two-way communication between heaven and earth. When you throw something up, something comes down. Communication. And so James said, when you are oppressed, pray, not complain. In the same vein, the psalmist said in Psalm 50 verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will answer you, and I will deliver you. In, in other words, seek for help, and you will find it. So, Bible said, and he answered Zerubbabel. If you have prayed, expect the answer. You will receive it in the name of Jesus. Point number three is our first point is the background to the story that Zerubbabel was facing a near difficult task. Number two, God answered him because he had been talking. And number three point, he spoke unto me. He answered and spoke unto me. So after Zerubbabel spoke to the Lord, the Lord responded by also speaking to him. So the question is, when last did you hear God? When last did you hear the word of God? When last did you hear God talk to you? If God is truly your father, if God is truly your creator, if God is truly your source, is there anyone who is not in talking terms with his biological father? I'm talking about that for one year you have not communicated with your biological father who is alive. That for a space of one month you have not heard his voice, he has not heard your voice. For a space of one year, you have not heard his voice, has not heard your voice. 
the space, the space of three years, you have not heard your father say something to you. I'm talking on the physical, biological aspect. Then, how can you say God is your father and your father, you have never had anything? Now, the word of God is the mind of God. Many of us are asking, how do we know the will of God? How do we know the mind of God? Zerubbabel got to know the mind of God because God spoke to him. The word of God is the will of God. The word of God is the mind of God. In fact, the word of God is God. According to the Bible, Evangelum secundum your anem, the gospel according to John, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apud deum, et deus erat verbum, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Therefore, if you have the word of God, God is by your side. If you have your Bible by your side, if the Word is talking to you, that's why we should be students of the Word, such as to know the mind of God, such as to know the will of God. It was a discouraging period for Zerubbabel, but he got courage because he had access to the Word of God. Don't joke with the Word of God. Don't play with the Word of God. The Word of God is a solution carrier. The Word of God is a solution carrier. Career. We are not saying that we are not aware that there are issues, that there are challenges, but we are saying that we are aware that there is a solution to the issues. There is a solution to the challenges. And that solution is in the word of God. Point number four. He says, he spake unto me and say, let's all read it, say unto Zerubbabel. I think we shall be taking it verse by verse. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Unto Zerubbabel. The word was spoken unto Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel did not hear or operate by hearsay. Meaning that there is a customized, a customized word for you in every situation of your life. Let God give you direction. Let God speak to you. Let open your heart, open your ears to listen, to be able to understand what God has for you. Don't run with another person's vision. Don't do what others are doing because you may not know what God has told them. There's a difference between what God has said to every human being, generally, to specific instructions. There are certain steps we are not supposed to take until there is a specific instruction. Little one, the first Samuel chapter 3, tell them, Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Lord, talk to me. That should be our prayer. Lord, talk to me. I'm in this relationship. Lord, talk to me. I am in this business. Lord, talk to me. I want to make this journey. Lord, talk to me. I want to know the word of God. That means, God, give me direction. God give me direction. I want to marry him. I want to marry her. Has the Lord spoken? Have you seen divine green light? I want to embark on this course. I want to read this course. Is it because your friend is reading that course? God created you and he did not give you the same destiny with your friend. So must you read the course your friend is reading? Lord, talk to me. I want to belong to this ministry. You see, my friend is in teaching ministry. I must be in teaching ministry. Is that the way to choose? My neighbor is in the intercessory minister. I want to be in the prayer minister. Is that how to, to, to make the choice? Lord, talk to me. So it is important that by divine guidance, we take steps. That is what we are seeing in the life of Zerubbabel. Praise the Lord. Point number five. What then did God say to him? He says, not by might. Not by might. Are we saying that might is wrong? No, might is not wrong. There's what in, uh, they call the Hobbesian society, Thomas Hobbes. He said that might in right, might, when might becomes right, when the society is so nasty and might is right, that means survival of the fittest. If you can kill, kill. If you can cheat, cheat. Something like that. Might is also a gift. But when it comes to the work of God, not human might. For 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 9 says, By strength of arm shall no man prevail. By strength of arm shall no man prevail. What the Greek calls might is dunamis or iskus. And what does that mean? 
Excuse or dynamics means ability, inherent power, or physical strength. Physical strength is also a gift, but it has limitation. Samson, the strongest person on earth was Samson. But Samson did not actually win those victories by his physical strength. The Bible always says, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And so what you are saying is, in spite of your strength, submit it to the Lord such that the Lord who gave you the strength in the first place will use, help you use it to manifest victory. So he said to Zerubbabel, not by might. In case you are considering your muscles, in case you are looking yourself up in the mirror, as some people do, you go to church late because you are before the mirror, looking at your makeup, looking at your body build, and so on and so forth, looking at it. I didn't say it is bad. But that is not your ultimate. He says, not by might. Point number five, point number six, not by power. He says, not only that is not by might, is also not by power. What the Greek calls dunamis, iskus, or kratos. Why? There are different types of power. Everybody on earth today is in search of power. Everybody on earth today is hungry for power. Power is good. Power intoxicates. And they say power also corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that is why you don't have to rely on power. That does not mean that power is bad. Because power operates in different levels. There is physical power. Might. There is political power. There is economic power. There is intellectual power. Of course, power is from God when he used within the ambience of his supervision. But to rely solely on power outside of the source of it, it goes and becomes arbitrary. You are sure to misuse it. And that's why I say, it's not by might. Neither is it by your military power. There's military power. It's not by military power. So forget about the army you have. In fact, if you look at the people of Israel, in fact, when Gideon was to go to war, God said, remove many people. And just for, for Gideon and the people of Israel to understand that God was the one giving victory, not by power, not by might, he said, go with only few people, 300 people. And they were able to win thousands of people with 300 people to show that the victory actually is of the Lord. So what are we trying to say? We are trying to understand that God is here giving kind of an expo for victory in life. You are going to that exam. Don't think that you will pass because of your know-how. That is why in everything we do, we say by the grace of God. There are people who are struggling more than you are struggling, yet you are richer than they are. There are people who are more careful than you are, but they are sick and you are not sick. There are people who do exercise who do things humanly possible to be physically fit, but you are more physically fit than they are. Sometimes, all, that does not mean that doing all those things are bad. To be intelligent is not bad. I am also intelligent, and I thank God for it. But you don't have to use any gift, whether it is your physical beauty, academic um, quotient, whatever it is, intelligent quotient, you don't have to use anything outside of the will of God or His purview. And that is exactly what we are learning from this passage. Point number seven, he says, But by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. But by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Said in spirit to me, Vitit dominus exercitum. But by my spirit, says the lord of hosts in other words god's work must be done by the power of god by my spirit simply means by my own energy by my own strength by my own power so there is human strength and there is divine strength there is human power and there is divine power and there is god's power which is what we're talking about when he said by my own spirit he said it is my work and therefore it has to be by my own strength, by my own power. In other words, don't rely on your technical know-how. Don't rely on your IQ, your intelligent quotient. Rely on the Lord. For the work 
is the work of the Lord and so it must be done by the power of the Lord and guess what the Holy Spirit is the powerhouse of divinity the Holy Spirit is the powerhouse of the Godhead I talked the other day about what I call the, the Trinitarian dispensation that means the work head the workload of the Godhead the workload of the Godhead how work is vision as it is vision the Holy Spirit is the in charge of power manifestation that is why i want to let you know that the father operates by the spirit's power mm -hmm. yes the son operates by the spirit's power that is the in their own plan we talked about you know uh, 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 the, the, the inner workings of god within the godhead and we discover that even though God is one, everybody has what is needed. For instance, God the Father created, but by the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God was the first revealed in the scripture. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The Spirit of God was hovering over the Spirit. So creation was done by the Spirit of God. Psalm 104 verse 29 verse 30 tells us about that. He takes his Spirit, they die. He releases his Spirit, send forth our Spirit to the Lord. And they shall recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. So when God wanted to renew the face of the earth, he needed the Spirit. Psalm 104 verse 29 and verse 30. So the work of renewal is under the purview of the Holy Spirit. He is the powerhouse of the Godhead, what of God the Son? God the Father operates by the Holy Spirit. God the Son equally operates by the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that the Holy Spirit is more powerful than God the Son or than the God the Father. That is in their own way. That is in their own way how they chose to operate. We have already talked about it. Hallelujah. The Bible records in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 3. We know this story. Jesus was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. For Mary said, how can this be? I know not a man. And the angel gave Mary an expo. He said, the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And that is why that thing will be born. The person, the child of God will be called the Son of God. Because the Holy Spirit will cover you with his shadow. So Jesus was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? He grew, but he could not perform his ministry until the Holy Spirit came and empowered him because Jesus operated on earth as man. Jesus operated on earth as man. The Bible recorded that while John was baptizing in the desert, Jesus came to John to be baptized. And immediately Jesus was baptized as he was coming up out of the water, the Bible said the Spirit of God alighted on him came upon him in the form of a dove and that was when the ministry of jesus was inaugurated from that day he started his ministry he never went back to the carpentry workshop guess what before the coming of the spirit he was just a carpenter doing the work of carpentry but when the holy spirit came upon him his ministry started that was when he was able to fulfill the reason why God sent him to it, as Peter had to tell us in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power. And he went about doing good. No more repairing benches. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed because God was with him. So even God works by his own power, the power. Of the Holy Spirit. That's just the message. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it alone. You cannot do it by yourself. And so, when Jesus was to go, he said to the apostle, you see, I have been with you for three years. I have taught you. I have prepared you. But tarry in Jerusalem. You are going to come to that. Don't go until the powerhouse comes. Until power is released. Acts of the apostles chapter 1 verse 8. You shall receive power. Not before, but after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that is what we are looking forward to. What is Pentecost? The reception of power. What is Pentecost? The manifestation of that power that came upon the apostles and they did two things with it. What the church calls uh, proclamation, kerygma, and catechesis. Kerygma and catechesis. What is kerygma? The dynamic proclamation of the word of God, which Peter 
stood up and did in one sermon and 3,000 souls we are one to the Lord and not only that they started a process of cat cases grooming those who had come to the faith and that is what the church calls cat cases where the cat keys catechizes the cat women in the cat women into the catechism manual in the process of what is called cat cases that is the work of the church <clears throat> to preach and to teach to preach, and when people come to the food, they are groomed through catechism or catch cases to be able to know, to be able to understand their faith. Just like we said the other day, the motor of Saint Asem, find this coherence, intellectual faith in search of understanding. That is the what the Spirit of God does for the Father, for the Son, for the Church. So you cannot do without the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do without the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he continues, point seven. He says, that is verse seven equally. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. He says, who are you? O great mountain. Guess what? He has addressed it. Two things we will see here. Number one, he didn't say, what are you? He said, who are you? The who is supposed to be referring to a human being, a person, a human being. So it's possible that what we call mountain is man-made. It's possible that what we call obstacle in your life is man-made. But who is that man? Who is that woman that has considered himself or herself a mountain, a barrier, an obstacle, a hindrance, an encumbrance that you will not succeed, that you will not be who God made you to be? Now, Meditation chapter 3, verse 10, 7, 6, Who is he that speaketh a thing and it cometh to pass when the Lord has not commanded it? Who is that mountain? Who is that obstacle? Who say you will not be who God made you to be? Who say you will not achieve who God, God made you to achieve? Who is he sitting on your destiny, blocking your, your marriage, blocking you have your progress. Who is he? The Bible says, Who art thou, O mountain? Yes, another thing. The Bible called it mountain. The Bible called it mountain. How can you call something mountain and you're asking it what it is? In other words, God is trying to say, I'm not saying that I don't know that you are a mountain. I'm not saying that I don't know that you are a giant. <clears throat> I am not saying. I am not saying that I don't know that you are a stronghold. I am not saying I don't know that people fear you. I am not saying that I don't know that you are called COVID-19. I am not saying I don't know that you are coronavirus. I am not saying I don't know that you have killed many people. But there is, there, there is always what they call exemption clause. Exemption clause. When it comes to Zerubbabel, you lose what you are. You lose what you are. What is that mountain before you? The Bible says, before Zerubbabel, you are no more a mountain. You, you cease. You become a plane. Before others, you may be a mountain. It doesn't matter. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, ma. Don't fear what they fear. Don't confess what they confess. Because you are not ordinary. You are not the same with every other person. When pneumonia kills people, don't confess pneumonia. As what, what can kill you? People are fearing coronavirus. Yes, we know you may be killing people. But that is not for you. Not by power. Not by might. By the spirit of the living God. Who are you? Oh, mountain. You are asking somebody who, and you are calling the person the name. So God is saying, I know you are mountain. What is, a mountain blocks your view. A mountain blocks progress. You cannot just be moving and the mountain and just moving as if nothing is there. No, you can no longer progress. Except you begin to rigmarole around the mountain or climb the mountain. So God is saying, I know you are a mountain. But that is before others. Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. I decree every mountain standing against your progress. Every satanic mountain against the will of God in your life. Let it crumble by fire. Let it crumble by fire. Let it crumble by fire. You will be who God made you to be. You will achieve what God destined for you. You will reach the height ordained for you by your creator. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Point eight. He says, the word of the Lord came again unto Zerubbabel. <laughs> the word of the Lord came again unto Zerubbabel. I'm not saying you have not been hearing the word of God, but it's coming again. And this time around with a different grace. With a different grace. Second Chronicles chapter 18 verse 4. The king said to the king, the king of Judah said to the king of Israel, that's Jehoshaphat, said to the king of Israel, let us hear the word of God for today. Let us know what God has for today. We had it yesterday. That does not matter. Excuse me, you breathed yesterday. Will you stop breathing today because of yesterday's breath? No. So there is, word of God is ever dynamic. 
And so it came again. It came again. It's coming to you again. Even if you didn't receive anything yesterday, expect favor today. Expect healing today. Expect grace today. Expect open doors today. Expect breakthrough by the same word of God. Point nine is very, very interesting. Verse 9 says, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also finish it. There is what we call from foundation to finish. The what we call Alpha and Omega anointing. Alpha and Omega anointing. Now, Alpha is the beginning of the Greek alphabet, just like we have A in English alphabet, while Omega is like the Z. So, we have Alpha, Beta, Lama, Gamma, Delta, Zeta, Beta, Upsilon, etc. Until you get to Omicron, and then the last one is Omega. Alpha and Omega means beginning and the end. So, there's an anointing to begin, then an anointing to end. There are many people that begin, they don't finish. But God said, you see Zerubbabel, this house is beginning, he will finish it. I prophesy, you will finish your house. I say, you will finish your house. You will finish your house. That relationship will not break. You will marry. You will finish your marriage. There are people who are married for 10 years, and the marriage breaks. Why? There was the Alpha, there was no Omega. I decree upon your life, upon your marriage, upon your business, where you are working, they will not return to you, except when you decide to fire your boss. Alpha and Omega will work for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible said, you see Zerubbabel, he started it. He will finish it. What you start, you will finish. God does not abandon his project halfway. You are his project. He will not abandon you. You will also not abandon your own project halfway. Go and be fulfilled. In the mighty name of Jesus. You will fulfill your career. You will fulfill your study. It's not after two years they will expel you from the school. I refuse it for you. I reject it for you. Your destiny shall be fulfilled. It shall not be aborted. In the mighty name of Jesus. Finally, in conclusion. Finally, in conclusion. The Bible made us to know that all these things we are missing, that we are released. The message was released to Zerubbabel by the instrumentality of a prophet called Zechariah. And so I conclude by saying that everybody needs a Zechariah. Everybody needs a Zechariah. When Zerubbabel was discouraged, when Zerubbabel was to be depressed or downcast, God raised Zechariah to come and speak to him. You need a Zechariah. A voice of encouragement. A voice of courage. A voice of support. A destiny helper that will come to meet you at a point of need and help you to stand and help you to fulfill your destiny and help you to remain focused. Wherever your Zechariah is, may he show up in the name of Jesus. Receive your Zechariah and go forth in life through Christ our Lord. Amen.